In just a few moments, we're gonna start our next session, which is an amazing interactive panel. Um, these are some of the best um, sessions that I've ever seen in a CME setting. So please um, enjoy. Uh, we're gonna talk about biologic treatment selection and management. This is a panel discussion. I think, uh, well, I can tell you, I learn something every time I see uh, this panel uh, present. Um, we, I learn different tricks about educating my patients and managing them with all the biologics. So um, without further ado, I'd like to welcome back up to the stage Dr. April Armstrong. And then for the first time today, uh, I'd like to bring up Kara Gooding, who comes to us as a physician assistant from Arizona, and TJ Chow, who comes to us from Georgia. Yeah, there he is. <laughs> the Mandalorian just jumped on the stage. The Dermalorian. <laughs> okay, so Dr. David Cohen for the first time today comes to us as a Charles and Dorothy Harris Professor of Dermatology and Ronald Perlman Department of Dermatology as the Vice Chair of Clinical Affairs of Dermatology of <clears throat> the Director of Occupational, Environmental, and Allergic Dermatology from New York University, NYU in New York, New York. So let me give this to Kara. Good morning. So very excited to be here. Thank you again, Joe, for inviting us back to do this panel discussion. We've heard a couple of excellent lectures already this morning from Dr. Armstrong and Dr. Glick. So we've heard a lot of information about psoriasis. It's a super exciting time. As Dr. Glick mentioned, we have 11 different agents that sometimes can be a little bit overwhelming for us as clinicians trying to really go through and decide what's the best one for our patients. So over the next 45 minutes, we have these three psoriasis experts that are gonna help us kind of go through that information. So we're gonna talk about biologic treatment selection and management. So our, here's our learning objectives. We're gonna learn about initiation of biologics and safety considerations that guide biologic selection for our psoriasis patients. And then we're also gonna learn how to manage patients on biologics, including, including those with psoriatic arthritis. And we'll also talk about pediatric psoriasis patients as well. Here is a very comprehensive biologic and small molecule cheat sheet that I would highly recommend that all of you print out when you get home, take it in, provide it to your medical assistants as well. Joe and I spent many, many hours going through this and I think it's the most comprehensive cheat sheet that you're gonna find available today. And so basically this cheat sheet has each of the 11 biologics as well as our small molecule agents. It has the company that manufactures them, the brand name, the generic name, the indicated dose both for initiation and maintenance, and then the pathway. So this will also be a great reference as we talk about generic names throughout the next four days of our conference. So biologic selection criteria for psoriasis, Dr. Armstrong was on the panel for actually these guidelines. So these are um, guidelines when we're gonna, what do we, when do we consider using a biologic for our patients? So if, if the patient has moderate to severe psoriasis, and according to the American Academy of Dermatology and the National Psoriasis Foundation, that's at least 10% body surface area, or if it involves functionally important areas. So those would be patients that have psoriasis on their face, their scalp, their genitalia, their hands or their feet. Of course, our insurers and payers sometimes have different ideas. They oftentimes want the patients to have at least a BSA of 10% or greater. They want the patient to have at least moderate disease and then a POSI of greater than 12. If the patient has active psoriatic arthritis, that is definitely a patient you need to be considering a biologic in. As we know, that's a very progressive, destructive joint disease, and we have great agents that can prevent that. And then overall, if the patient just has treatment goals that are not being met, their quality of life is being reduced, or they have severe intractable itching, those are also patients you may want to consider a biologic in. So we're gonna start with our first panel discussion question. How do you explain the mechanism of action to your biologic patients? Dr. Armstrong, I'll have you go ahead and start. 
Sure, thank you, Kara, and I'm so great to be on this panel with TJ and also with Dr. Cohen here um, and you and, and, and uh, um, to really have the time to go through some of the, these key questions. I think the first thing when I think about in terms of explaining the mechanism of action of biologics is actually try to get a sense of patients' baseline understanding and their health literacy. Um, and the reason for that is because patients are oftentimes coming in with potentially um, preconceived ideas of how these work, and they have their fears as well. So for me, I always ask them, you know, what is your baseline? What is your current understanding of, um, of these medications? And that gives me a good baseline of where they are, and then I kind of tailor it um, accordingly. Um, so overall, the way I typically explain is that um, that their immune system, a part of their immune system, not the whole immune system, is actually hyperactive. And that's important for them to understand because because of that part of their immune system is hyperactive, that's why they have psoriasis. And so what we're trying to do with most of our biologic medication, and I, whichever I select, and then I say what we're trying to do is that we know part of the, the culprits is because you are producing too much of, whether it's IL-17 IL or, or IL-23, this inflammatory molecule. So we're really trying to normalize the level of, um, of, that, infl of that inflammation molecule in your body, hopefully to the level of a person without psoriasis. I also tell them that sometimes when you still see psoriasis plaques left uh, after treatment, that means we may not have normalized it completely, um, but it's very important to know. So I, I have this one hand as a person without psoriasis and another hand as where they are. Sometimes, you know, they, we oftentimes, our goal is to normalize it perfectly, but sometimes that's not possible. So we're maybe doing it to here, and that's why you see a little bit residual plaque left, or sometimes we may overshoot a little bit, but that, that's still a minority and most of the cases we almost never come, come down to here. And this is very important because they hear a lot of immunosuppression. So they say, but is it immunosuppression? Yes, I'm suppressing it, but I'm really trying to normalize it to the level of where we want to be. So I then essentially, depending on the biologic that we choose, um, kind of substitute the word, uh, whichever the, um, the cytokine that we have with that. And if they want more information, I can go in and, and talk about a little bit more. But I find that patients really respond to this visual, uh, this is where the person without psoriasis is, yours is up here, we're trying to normalize it, we're not trying to do it all the way to here. And so, so they kind of get this relative understanding of how uh, most of their, these agents work. Cohen? Yeah, I, I think the, the, qu the question or the necessity to explain the mechanism is really based on what the patient wants you to explain to them. I think sometimes these questions come up out of fear. Uh, patients are concerned about what you're gonna put them on and what is it gonna do. That immunosuppressive thing comes up all the time. Sometimes it's appropriate to say, you know, a lot of the older drugs for psoriasis, like methotrexate and cyclosporin, they are broad immunosuppressive agents. You could take them orally, but advances in, in, in the pharmaceutical science of psoriasis has allowed us to target. I like using the word right-sizing um, abnormal immune responses, not necessarily suppressing, but right-sizing it, bring it into an appropriate balance. We're not gonna get rid of all your IL-17 or 23, but we're gonna try to tamp it to a more appropriate setting. So you gotta figure out what their baseline knowledge is. Sometimes they don't wanna know what the mechanism is, um, and sometimes it's just a tacit way of saying, listen, I'm a little bit of afraid of these things, and explain to me why I shouldn't be afraid of these on how they work. So I would third the uh, statement on uh, immunosuppression. When I, what I explain to my patients is if you think about the immune system as a gas gauge, you don't want the gas gauge on low, you don't want it on high either. Um, so when you have psoriasis, you have psoriatic arthritis, the gas gauge is high. So you wanna bring the gas gauge down to the middle. If you go below that, that's really not what the biologics do. Those are some of the other drugs that we use. But the drug, the biologics that we'll be talking about really get you back to that uh, middle line. And I, I find that doing that, like a visible explanation of what we're doing 
kind of puts them at ease as to, as to the treatment. Um, in regards to the different mechanisms of drugs, I stole something from Dr. Jerry Bagel about seven or eight years ago. Um, and I literally have used it in the majority of my patients. And uh, it's, it's essentially, you know, if you think of psoriasis as a leak in your house, um, and you know, the, the real leak, which is the psoriasis, is occurring outside of the house in a garden hose. Um, if you go inside the house to turn the water off, well, you turn the water off to everything. You can't shower, you can't wash your hands, you can't do anything really with water and clean. So I, th I said that's really where the anti-TNFs work. If you go outside of the house to the garden hose, that where that uh, to the spigot on the side of your house, that's really where IL-23s work. If you go to the end of the garden hose to stop it, it's where IL-17s work. So I try to explain that so they understand where we're affecting the disease in the immune system, um, and then we can make decisions from there. So I like to I like to use a more visual approach when I'm talking to my patients. Just and by the way, I would also second what Dr. Cohen says. There's a lot of patients who don't want this information. There's patients that just want us to tell them what to do. Uh, but then there's those hesitant patients that aren't sure. You're telling them you're gonna give them an injection and they get apprehensive. So explaining it the best way possible, I think, is, is the way to go. Excellent, those are all great ways of explaining. And I, I agree, it does depend on the, the savviness of your patient and, and how much they really do wanna know. I, one of the things I like to use is I like to say these are very, very specific targeted therapies. And I, I actually don't like to use the word immunosuppressive. I say this is more of something that's modulating your immune system because especially in today's world, patients are very fearful of agents that are immunosuppressive. They think, oh, we're gonna put them on prednisone. And I think that's oftentimes what their reference point is. So I like to say this is something that's very targeting a very, very small or tweaking a very small part of your immune system that's responsible for psoriasis and then going into a little bit more depth on, on which particular agent we're using on, on that particular um, pathway. All right, we are gonna move on to the next question, and that is what questions do you ask every patient to help guide your selection for a biologic? So we'll have Dr. I, Cohen. I, I think this gets to the heart of uh, uh, an important point. Uh, you heard right, right before this panel, uh, there are 11 uh, biologics, right? Um, and if you find that easy and acceptable to deal with, you're a lot smarter than I am because I have a hard time with all of that, right? And we have two more coming, so I'm gonna walk into a room and I already know they have psoriasis or I'm gonna look at them and as they're talking to me, I could see psoriasis in their scalp, on their elbows. And I have the, the benefit of, you know, like a dozen choices now and which one am I gonna pick? And they all work pretty well, and some work better than others, right? So I can really get myself wrapped around the axle on what drug I'm gonna pick. So as I go through the history, I, I like the sorting hat thing, because the sorting hat, you know, basically will, t the patient will tell you what class of drug you think is the best one to go to. My advice to you, because this is what I do, Pick your favorite IL-23 drug, your favorite IL-17, your favorite TNF, and, and a favorite oral and agent. Because you know, the syringes and the pens all look different. The loading dosages are all different. The timing is all different. The, the forms you have to fill out are all different. And the things the staff have to do are all different for every one of those drugs. So to become a master of 14 medicines is a fool's errand, right? You should have your, your, your first choice and your second choice in there and know those well. And you'll listen to the lectures here and figure out what you think the best ones are for you. I tend to like to pick the best, most efficacious drug because within the class, the side effects are not terribly different from each other. And then you just go through these questions. You have arthritis, you happen to have cancer, any demyelinating disease, ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease, depression, congestive heart failure. Already, you know, um, arthritis check. Okay, 17, 23, maybe an oral agent. Solid organ malignancies, Psst, press the brakes now, we got an issue. 
right? Is it old? Is it unlikely to come back? Or is it, you know, a new, new disease? MS, you're probably going to not even think about TNFs. Uh, you see in Crohn's, you'll probably put the 17s lower on your list and bring the 23s up higher. So you see answering these questions, yes or no, immediately starts ticking you into one of those columns and you've got your favorite one ready to go. As far as infections are concerned, that'll be part of your workup on whether you're ready to start or not, right? Sometimes it'll be a showstopper and it's a good time to discuss vaccine status. But I really wanted to get the point across that this is very overwhelming, all of these things, and we keep having new ones coming out, and then you have recuts of data from studies done five years ago, and everything seems brand new and very unmanageable. So the way to do it is put them in columns and pick your favorites and execute based on what these things show you. I'll stop there, because that's kind of wordy. <laughs> Well, first of all, I'd like to say, David, you are very smart. Um, <laughs> That's and, nicely uh, affirming. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I think David made some great points. Um, so even when I look at this list that's projected in front of you, I would prioritize a few things. So first of all, do they have solid organ malignancy? Because if they have active solid organ malignancy, then we might not want to think about biologics at all. Um, so so definitely, and then when we're thinking about arthritis, and I know we're going to talk about that in a little bit more detail later, um, so I won't spend too much time on it, um, but, but that's, that's very important. You know. So I, even when I look at this list, I think the top four, arthritis, solid organ malignancy, the multiple sclerosis, you immediately rule out the TNFs. Ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, personal history, you rule out uh, IL 17s. And when we go then, depression, suicidality, it may not play as much of a role in my personal consideration of biologics. And congestive far ha heart failure is a relative, I would say, contraindication, mostly from infliximab data, and, and we don't use that much infliximab period, so, so less of a consideration. When we go to infections, among the ones that are listed, I would say hepatitis B is an is a absolute contraindication typically for TNF inhibitors. So I do ask that to kind of uh, um, potentially take that class out of the consideration. And the rest is something that, you know, we talk about and we really, it, it's a, it's a benefit-risk ratio. I talked about TB is not preferred for TNF inhibitors, but some of my, your patients, maybe their formulator only allows for one of the TNF inhibitor medications. So can you still, can they still be on TNF inhibitors, yes. Um, you just need to really make sure you monitor them very closely, make sure that they've completed their latent TB treatment, that you're checking their TB, monitoring and checking their TB yearly. So I just want to kind of, of the ones that are listed, help to um, prioritize some. Some are absolute no's and help you eliminate the different classes. Others are more uh, of a conversation between benefit and risks. So I would say that I would also go with the same approach that Dr. Armstrong and Dr. Cohen take. And then I, one step beyond that is also looking at the patient, asking the patient, what are you willing to do? How often are you willing to inject yourself? Um, how often are you willing to treat? Because one of the biggest factors that cause patients to walk away from therapy is they feel like you know, they didn't have a big part in the decision. So if we tell the patients, well, you have to do this medication and it's gonna be a one shot a month or whatever it is, maybe that's not something that they really would wanna go with. Um, so I like to go through the different options with the different drugs to kind of give them a sense of what's available and what they're willing to do. Now, what, what I do then is I interject and I say, well, tell me a little bit more about your history, your medical history. Um, you know, if there's ulcerative colitis, that's definitely gonna impact me to go a different direction. Um, malignancy is probably the biggest one. I, I like to draw a line with patients and say, you know, the older drugs have warnings for malignancy. The drugs, you know, the, essentially the anti-TNF agents. The newer drugs don't have a warning for cancer. So that's, that right there is what's important. Um, because if they've had cancer or if they are, you know, exquisitely concerned about cancer, there's going to be some hesitancy and potential for, you know, the loss of willingness to take the medication within a year or two. The patients may start asking them themselves, 
you know, do I need to be worried about cancer? You know, it's, this says a cancer warning, is this gonna show up on me? So I'd like to address those issues up front um, in addition. And then obviously, you know, some of the other concerns, histoplasmosis, that's not something that in my area of the country we're necessarily worried about. Tuberculosis, definitely uh, get that checked every year. Um, but I think taking the approach of talking about the risks as well as what they're willing to do is the best way to go. Excellent, I think that was very comprehensive. I do have a question as far as the solid organ malignancy. So if you have a patient that's otherwise a candidate for a biologic and they've had a solid organ malignancy, what is your approach to that patient? Is it a hard no? Uh, I typically say after five years, um, if it's bef less than five years, um, I'll generally call their oncologist and just get maybe a letter or some sort of verbal approval and documentation, uh, and document that, I, would say, I should say, uh, in the chart. Yes, I, I agree with TJ, um, because our IL-17 and some of our IL-17 and our IL-23 uh, medications have data on patients. They included data. Uh, patients uh, enrolled in the clinical trials who had a uh, history of solid organ malignancy that's five years or greater in remission. And what was seen in the um, post-registration studies when, they, when you follow these small cohort of patients over time that their rates of recurrence weren't different from those uh, who of the general population. So I think based on this data, I, I would uh, exactly to what TJ just said. I think if it's less than five years and uh, um, let's say three years out, and, and something, I, I definitely check with oncology uh, to make, their, make sure their oncologist is, is okay. And the reason is because if you say, sure, I'll start you on biologic, and next thing you know, they go to their oncologist appointment, the on oncologist is a little freaked out, guess who would have the trump card, right, here. So it's very important to collaborate with oncologists. I also have the patient, I also document the, in the chart, the patient acknowledges you know, the benefits and risks uh, of being on a biologic with a history of malignancy, which may or may not which may include the recurrence of their malignancy. Um, so, so you want to you want to document that because uh, if you're treating a patient, someone is going to have recurrent cancer, and you want to make sure patient selection is very important uh, here as well. So, um, I would use some of the judgments uh, here, um, and especially for drugs that don't have, for example, that, that in their label, actually, and, and because the drugs that have that in that label, you, you can also add, I've discussed all the risks that, that are you know, in, in the package insert with the patient. So documentation here is very important. Patient selection is very important. I, I, you know, the, the cancer thing can get, you can really get tied up in it, and, and I think the 17s and the 23s do not have boxed warnings about cancer, right? And certainly, I think if you're looking at lymphomas and leukemias, you're going to stay away from biologic drugs. They're too hyper-variable, and, and I, I never feel comfortable with, with those and the biologic agents. Solid order malignancies, you want to get them stable to a degree, but you know, the, you, you don't have to take a defensive posture when there's no data to suggest that patients on these for really long times get excess solid organ cancers for the most part, maybe some skin cancers with some, with, with some of these. And uh, one other thing, and this is, just, this is just 32 years of being in dermatology, this happens, um, eventually you'll have patients on a variety of medicines that get cancer. Right, They get cancer, and, and they may make an immediate assumption that the drug that you have them on has caused that cancer. And how you respond when you hear that data will change the way you interact with that patient permanently, will also change the disposition of how you interact with them, how you interact with lawyers and things like that. It's really quite important. And the issue is you have them on a medicine because they needed to be on that medicine. They had moderate to severe psoriasis, and having that disease untreated is not a freebie, right? Having moderate to severe psoriasis has an impact on your system, and, and, and Dr. Armstrong has written a lot about that and can elaborate on it even more. But in the old days when it was between cyclosporin and methotrexate and not treating, maybe you can make an argument for the balance. But these days it's hard to make that argument not to treat because of your fear of adverse effects. That doesn't exist now the same way. 
And when I hear a patient has cancer, I say, tell me more about it. Do not knee jerk and say, it's got nothing to do with the medicine I wrote you for. Right? Number one, you don't know that for sure, and being defensive like that is not being patient-centric, right? You have to think of the patient. They're scared they got this diagnosis, right? Tell me a little bit more about it. Tell me what the oncologist said. What do they think about the medicine you're on? You're inquiring, because don't forget, just because you got cancer doesn't mean your psoriasis gets to go away because you've checked off a much worse box. So you're gonna have to deal with that, and many times we're not stopping the medicine, or we're putting it on hold um, because of chemotherapy. And you gotta remind the patients, many chemotherapies will make the psoriasis get better, right? And it may not come right back immediately, but you gotta develop a long-term plan and interlace with the rest of the medical team for um, their care. I think that's the best way to stay out of trouble. Make sure you're getting on the patient's side and not put up you know, uh, walls for defending yourself. There's no reason for that, right? You put them on medicine for all the right reasons. That's just my personal take on something like that. Happens all the time. Yeah. Excellent, those are excellent pearls. And in real world things that we see as we all practice long enough, we do, we, these situations come up and we have to know how to handle them. All right, we're gonna move on to the next panel question, which is what labs do you check prior to starting a biologic and how frequently do you monitor these labs in the maintenance therapy? So, TJ. So uh, when I do labs initially, I'll check a CBC, CMP, Quantifurone Gold, uh, hepatitis B surface antibody, hepatitis B surface antigen, and a hepatitis C. Um, I know some of you, from talking to you, that you do hepatitis panels. Um, you know, we looked at that in our office. You don't need really the hepatitis A. Um, it's also more expensive. Uh, it's a lot cheaper for the system if you break down to the specific ones that you really need. Um, and in regards to HIV, that's not something really that I do. However, if, if, if I have a patient that I'm suspecting that there could be a potential for that or, or uh, we have that conversation, then I would definitely check that um, if that were a concern. But otherwise, um, I wouldn't check that. Uh, histoplasmosis, that's again something that's, if you live in the Ohio River Valley or the Mississippi River Valley, um, you, you likely should check that to, just to be sure because you, know, you never know what will happen. And then I agree also with an annual skin cancer screening. Um, a lot of the patients that we're treating f for psoriasis, I mean, a lot of them may have spent years getting light therapy uh, 10 or 15, 20 years ago, um, you know, weekly, bi-weekly uh, treatments uh, with light therapy. So it may not even be the agent you're prescribing them that's caused them this to happen to them, but the light therapy that they received, the PUVA they received a long time ago. Oh, and do you want me to go ahead and talk about uh, what we do after? Or yeah, how often do you so, check those? So 10 or 15 years ago, I would check every three months, every patient every three months. Now as time's gone on with, you know, like I said previously, the newer agents, so anything from Cosentix forward, um, I'm checking now every six months uh, and then yearly uh, and then every six months after that. Um, I, I, I felt like it was really a waste of money to be testing every three months, which is, I know, uh, was typically the gold standard previously. Dr. Strong? Yeah, I, I thought TJ did a great job. It looks like he, he, he read the guidelines in its, in its entirety, and, and the other person who read it in its entirety may be my mother. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, but, uh, um, but really great job. Uh, what TJ just said about baseline labs is exactly what the guidelines suggest. Um, in terms of the monitoring, uh, the guidelines have really loosened in, with re regards to the required monitoring. So if you did yearly TB in those at risk, and those those are at risk are uh, those who may be on TNF inhibitors, those are uh, who may live in the endemic areas or in frequent contact with those who are in the in uh, coming traveling to the endemic areas. Um, so those are uh, those you want to uh, consider annual TB evaluation. Uh, and then the guidelines does not require uh, uh, follow-up TB evaluation for those on IL-17 or IL-23 inhibitors without the risk factors for developing TB. So it's, it's much more simplified and streamlined now. 
One, I agree with that. I, I, I won't further those comments other than the uh, annual skin exams. What I would suggest is you have someone with 20, 30, 40 percent total body surface area of psoriasis loaded with erythematous scaling indurated plaques. You're able to tell that apart from a squamous cell carcinoma in situ or a superficial basal cell? I find that pretty hard, right? So you might have these cancers staring you in the face on that initial exam, and now you give them a spectacularly effective biologic drug, and everything seems to go away, and you have some of these residual lesions. Those are the ones you zoom in on and say, maybe that's a basal cell, maybe that's a squamous cell. To the patient, the association is, you gave me this drug and I got skin cancer cancer, right? And, and, and that comes up every now and again. You just got to tell them straight out in the front, you know, we'll check you for skin cancer as you get clearer because some of these may be hiding in a plaque and it'll be impossible to see. You've just neutralized any association with bad things happening. And some of them will already have a history of a basal cell. You know what those things look like. They look like a plaque of psoriasis sometimes. So clear that up and then we'll give you a good check over and see if we find anything. So the, uh, the one confounding factor is, you know, we, we're being told with some of the IL-23s, you don't have to do yearly TB testing, but when you get that letter, that prior authorization letter from your insurance companies, a lot of them are going to require you to do that. So, you know, honestly, uh, it just uh, you should do it every year. It's just going to make it easier for you and your staff. That's a, that's a good point, TJ. Um, yes, your payers may require you to do that. Yeah. So, so and, and then that's a good opportunity to do the you know the yearly skin check, just getting that all done. And and I think the patients understand. I typically tell them, and which is true, that you know we need this evaluation for you to continue your biologic. That that's another thing. The biologic patients sometimes they don't come back because they're doing well. And then the problem is that if they don't come back, you miss that kind of yearly renewal. Then you have all these other touch points that you have to reinitiate. So I I try to emphasize every time I, I see a patient on biologic that I know you're doing well. You may feel like you don't need to come back, but it's really important that that you come back to see me. Otherwise, it can make the process of renewal a lot more complicated. I agree. I definitely, I actually follow my biologic patients every six months, but once a year they get a full skin exam. So my, my medical assistants are well trained to know that they, they have to get into a gown whether they want to or not and have a head to toe exam annually. The only other thing I would add that I do different, I live in, in Arizona, so I do check a coxy titer and I do that at baseline and also annually as well because valley fever is endemic where I live. So I need to make sure the patient doesn't have that before they are initiated on a biologic. All right, so what is your approach to a patient that comes back with an indeterminate quantifieron gold? They're frustrating. Yeah, that happens a lot, and uh, I think my gut reaction is what I always do is repeat it, um, just, just to be sure. If it's someone at risk or I could believe that there's something going on here, I'll often order a chest x-ray with the repeat uh, um, intermediate quantifieron gold, and if it's negative on, on both of those, I just move on. Um, if I get another indeterminate or positive back, I know the panel here has different approaches. Um, I, it depends on where they are in their dosing. If they have a dose coming up very soon, I'll ask them to hold it, and I'll get them to ID so they can initiate um, TB uh, therapy. Um, uh, and so that's how I usually do it. I'll flip it to the ID, but I always repeat. Most of the time it comes back negative. You know, if it's sitting around for a long time, you get these false intermediate tests back, and I learned that from this panel. So you repeat it and try to get into lab ASAP, and the chest x-ray is based on your estimate of bona fide risk. Um, and, and then I move it on. And then as soon as they're starting treatment with a TB therapy, I'll, I'll reconnect and start the t uh, psoriasis therapy back up. All right, and one little pearl when you, if you're gonna repeat the quantifieron gold test, it's really important that you actually have the patient go to the lab earlier in the week. So have them repeat it on a Monday or Tuesday because if that test sits in the lab over the weekend, oftentimes you'll get another indeterminate result. We We've had some instances in my practice where all of a sudden we're sending the patients to the lab and indeterminate, 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 indeterminate. 
And we investigated, and, and in that particular situation, it was occurring because of the lab tech. They had the same lab tech doing the same mistake over and over and over again. Um, so we, we had that fix. And then we started doing labs in our office, and um, we, had, we were training our medical assistants to do the lab drawing, and there was one in particular that was doing it incorrectly, and every time she did the blood work the way she did it. I'm not sure what she did, but it came back indeterminate every single time. So the test is really, really sensitive to, uh, you know, technical issues. Um, so if you get an indeterminate, you know, what I would do is, is definitely repeat it. Um, chances are it's going to come back negative the next time. Um, in regards to a positive quantiferon gold, what I've done is I've established a relationship with an infectious disease doctor in our, in our area. Um, so, it, you know, the other thing is if you get a positive quantiferon gold, it could be a false positive. Um, I, you, if you rerun that, you might find that it comes back negative. We had one patient in our practice got very upset because he, I guess, had to pay for the test. Um, and so when we, when we told him he had to do the test again, he lost it up front and was very upset. And then he ended up leaving their practice be because of it, but he was negative on that second test. So what happened there was probably um, a lab error. Now, if it comes back the second time positive, then we would do a chest X-ray and then refer them to infectious disease uh, for INR therapy. Yeah, I, I think the baseline suspicion and, and you know understanding patient risk factors for TB is really important, um, and I think that uh, I. Uh, I, I think, yes, Pearl's about having patient tested early in the week for quantiferon, and also uh, we've also had um, our institutional lab uh, indeterminate after everybody got indeterminate. So I call them, they're like, oh, you know, then they investigate it, and then they're like, okay, well, it's our lab error. So um, be really, uh, have a low threshold for retesting it because committing a patient to, you know, three or four months of uh, isoniazid plus rifampin is a, is a big deal and the fact that you know we're labeling patient now with with the fact that they you know they have a history of latent TB so um, so I think assessing for that baseline risk factors and the likelihood so what what is the you know pretest pop probability for this patient is really important and even sometimes as you're doing it routinely, if the pretest possibility is low and the patient has a positive one, uh, I will sometimes repeat it as well. I do treat all my own pa my patients uh, with latent TB myself, only because where I live in, in East Los Angeles, there's a high rate of uh, of uh, uh, TB positivity and latent TB positivity. So, and, and sometimes we can't get them to the ID so quickly. Um, so I would normally start treatment, and I would uh, I would then uh, typically then uh, would would start the biologics concurrently or, or wait, wait a month uh, after they're into their into their treatment. Uh, very briefly, you do want to know their LFTs before starting isoniazid because sometimes it can cause laboratory abnormalities in the LFT, so we want to know what the baseline level is. And with rifampin, they can turn their tears and their pee into this um, red color, pinkish color, so you want to warn them ahead of time. Yeah, in Arizona, I actually re rely on our, either our infectious disease colleagues, although it's very difficult to get patients in to see them, or they can go to their county health department and they will actually treat them for free there. And I typically, once they're on medication for a month, I will, I'll start them on their biologic or, or have them restart. And then as far as the coxie goes, since I do live where it's endemic, I oftentimes will just refer them back to their primary care doctor to initiate fluconazole, and again, once they've been on fluconazole for a month, then I will start them on their biologic at that point. And, and you do need to calm people, right? You know, they see, they'll see the result before I see the result in the electronic record. So this does not mean you have TB. It's a screening test. Let's just see if it's positive. This happens quite a bit because, you know, t TB in certain, for certain people, they may have, um, grandparents that have a history of it, you know, it's called consumption. Uh, it, it has a tough connotation to it, so you gotta really be gentle when you give that data. Okay, this is just a reference sheet when you do order the hepatitis B lab, so you can, again, print this out. If you do have something that comes back positive, you can use this as a, a reference sheet. Okay, we're going to move on to the next panel question, which is how do you approach treating patients with both psoriatic arthritis and psoriasis? Dr. Armstrong? 
Um, yes, so I alluded to a little bit in my talk uh, earlier, and uh, when we're, and, and you know, and Dr. Glick gave a fantastic talk afterwards, also presenting some of the new data with IL-17 inhibitors in psoriatic arthritis. I would say that overall, with this IL-17 inhibitor class, you get really good coverage for the skin as well as joint, and you don't have to worry about whether it's peripheral arthritis or axial arthritis. Um, there's data for that, and there's also data for treating people who are um, earlier in their PSA, as well as those with more developed PSA. Um, I think our IL-23 class of medications, as you know, many of them are also approved for psoriatic arthritis. So for patients with more, um, I think, milder uh, symptoms and so forth, or you're not sure, I think they will work uh, great as well. I think people who have more developed back stiffness, back pain, um, sacroiliitis, that's unilateral, um, then uh, I think we need a bit more data uh, to understand understand the, the role, uh, the efficacy of IL-23 uh, inhibitors in that particular patient population. So overall, good news, you are uh, probably, and most of the patients coming to our derm clinics would say have pretty mild joint disease, and half the time you're trying to decide whether they have PSA at all. So, um, so I, I think the reassuring news is that with our biologics, um, they will have some degree of coverage, uh, at least for their peripheral arthritis, which we can say for a lot of the uh, traditional oral uh, therapies for, for psoriasis. I think I, I, I agree completely with that. I think a lot of your patients with the comorbidities don't come in with a polar yes or no answer, right? It's, yeah, you know, my back's hurting a little bit more. Um, my, my wrists and my fingers and my knees hurt a little bit more. They're always kind of iffy. Do you have inflammatory bowel disease? No, but I've been told I have irritable bowel disease. Now, that happens all the time right now is that IBS, just undiagnosed IBD, I'm never sure, but I kind of hear it, I listen to it, I'll use the sorting hat and say, I'm gonna try the IL-23 in the IBS patient, and let's hear how those fingers, wrists, and back do when they're on it for a little while. If I'm not getting anywhere, I have a good rheumatolo you know, rheumatology group that I can help, but the description of arthritis to me increases my sense of urgency to at least start saying, Come on, let's treat this systemically. We're not, you're not going to get the pound tub of triamcin alone just to get the skin better. That's not the right approach for that, I think. I would agree with that. If, if the patient is having psoriatic arthritis, you really need to have a serious talk with them in regards to starting a biologic. Um, in, in, in my view, one of the worst things that you could have in a dermatology practice is a patient that you say, you know, you had them on an anti-TNF um, for, for years and then their skin is not doing well, so you switched them to an IL-23. And then lo and behold, a uh, couple months go by or, or, or even shorter than that, and they start calling you, I'm in pain, I can't move, I can't get up, I can't function at work. Um, and then they, you know, they end up in your office like once a week. Um, and you try to add things, you know, you add methotrexate, you add things in to try to ameliorate and get them stable, um, but sometimes they don't recapture that response. And so what do you do? If you can't get them into a rheumatologist, you have to make a decision. Um, now, there's, there's different reasons to go for, um, you know, anti-TNFs in that situation, like, you know, if you had them on Humira, maybe you could go back and do something like Simsia, um, or you could then move to an IL-17, um, but it's a, it's, a tough, it's a tough situation to be in in a practice for sure. Um, so my, my suggestion is to go back to what we said previously about the, the concerns about cancer, IBD, and kind of put, insert that into your decision about how you're gonna address this patient now that's um, in front of you. Now, I will tell you, if, if you don't make them better, they're gonna keep calling, and I've seen that happen a few times, and they'll make a lot of noise. So there's, the skin is one thing, but the joints are something much different. Um, if they're in a lot of pain, you really need to address that um, appropriately. Um, and if you can get them into a rheumatologist in that situation too, I think that's perfectly reasonable. Yeah, I was gonna agree with you on that and say, you know, it's don't be ashamed to, to use your rheumatology colleagues too. If, you're, if you have a patient on a biologic and, and their joints are really still bothering them, it's definitely important to get the rheumatology team involved as well. 
So we are actually out of time for our panel discussion. Uh -oh. We need like a couple more hours for this. Uh, some of the questions that we didn't get to, we may get to a little bit later in another panel discussion that we have this afternoon. Let's hear it for our amazing panelists. Thank you.